Hello there, good evening and welcome to your Sunday session here at This Side Rocks. My name is Scott Patterson. If you're joining me tonight on Sunday the 19th of November, as always, we, we thank you for your time. Don't forget This Side Rocks available right across social media. We're on YouTube and Facebook. You are potentially looking uh, in on either just now. If you are, please like, subscribe and share. Leave a comment if you like. We're right across social media on our YouTube channels. As you know, Twitter, Facebook, Threads and TikTok, we're also in there. We are rolling out lots of brand new content across on our audio. Or our our audio channel, easy for me to say if you do, check us out on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, etc. Um, we're available wherever you get your podcasts, indeed in the second episode of Reliving Rangers with Ben um, is available via Spotify and all those bits and pieces right now. He speaks to Kieran Wallace, a really, really good second episode. So um, if you get the chance to jump on our audio only platform, I suggest you do. You'll find lots on there to, to wet your whistle. So to speak, before we get into things and I introduce my my guest for this evening, I do want to say a huge congratulations to the Rangers women's football team today. A big, big, big win. Um, 2 0 victory over Glasgow City at Petersill Park in the city. Um, Rio Hardy again. Um, just coming up trumps when we need her to the most, a double uh, penalty in the first half and, and a goal um towards the, the end of the match to give Joe Potter a really important win um in her continuing tenure. Um, as Rangers women's club manager. We did speak to our pre-season, if you remember, and I did say I felt there was a good chance we would get her back on and we would have a trophy sitting on the table. I think as the season progresses, that seems to get a bit more realistic and we certainly hope it happens. Point to note, um, the women are now 11 points clear of, of Glasgow City um, in third position. So they're sitting in a very healthy position as things stand just now. If you are... Looking in, as I say, on YouTube or Facebook tonight, get your questions in in the chat. If we come to them, we will. Um, if they're relevant, we'll definitely get them on. If they're not, we'll get a giggle from them nonetheless. I should say that it's just he and me tonight. Um, JB joins us from the world. Hi, JB. How are you doing? Yeah, good evening, Scott. Evening, everyone. Yeah, um, um, unlike the last international break, uh, I felt like we went into this one with a little bit of momentum. I think the, it's not very often Rangers fans or football fans in general welcome an international break. I think we needed it. <laughs> uh, but this one felt as if we, we had some good momentum going. But sometimes it's good to take a wee breath and reset and hopefully uh, come back flying as we go into the, um, into the second quarter, if you will. Yeah, 100%. Now, listen, what I want to do is... Um, I've got a couple of on this days that I want to cover with you. However, um, anyone who follows the podcast will tell that you're just not from along the road and you are from um, Merseyside. And your other love um, have obviously been in the news this week. The mood in Everton around the streets just now around Goodison. Tell us about it. Yeah, so it's probably more so my brother, as I say. I've, ne I've never hit the fact that I've been Rangers first um, and keep an eye on the Everton results. But... Um, yeah, it's been strange. It's been a bit of a... People kind of knew it was coming, but didn't think it would ever come, if that makes sense. It was probably yeah. a week. You just, um, if we go back 10 years ago, whatever it was, you kind of knew that there was something bad that coming down the road, but you just didn't know how bad and and how harsh. Um, I think that there's very much going to be a bit of a us v the world mentality, I think, from now to the end of the season, uh, yeah. which I think galvanise them. Um, they've actually got off to not too bad of a start, to be fair to them, but um, it just you can understand why f football fans are getting frustrated. I mean, Everton, Everton fans are very much, uh, they class themselves as the people's club, uh, yeah. so the Merseyside, and they haven't quite taken that step into the full commercialised club, like a lot of the fans. I think that something like 80% of the fan base is from the city. Is from the city. Um, it's still, still, they still live and breathe it on a day to day basis. So um, it feels as if they feel harshly treated without knowing the ins and outs of everything. Um, it's just interesting they decided to pick on them as opposed to the some of the other teams. So obviously, Man City, I think, are up for 125 charges yeah. uh, for one and have been done for one, uh, rightfully or wrongly. So now it's going to, um, it's definitely going to spice some things up. And I know Manchester United go to Goodison Park next weekend. Uh, I'm sure that'll be a, a lively one. Um, so. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. One of the things I think I saw Jamie Carragher actually say, and I don't want to deviate away too much from what we'd obviously need to discuss tonight, but I did see um, Jamie Carragher speak about the, the sort of six that looked to break away from the Premier League, and I think they were fined something like £25 million between them, right. um, which is down there, down your neck of the woods, that's that piddle in the ocean, to be perfectly frank, and you... That, that ten point deduction could cost 
ever in a huge amount of money long term and certainly short term um mm-hmm. and we all know about the sort of heartache of, of your team maybe not being treated properly um so we want to watch and um i'm sure you'll keep us up to up to speed with how that's going down there listen and there's two on the days um that, that i want to cover um on this day 19th of november 1995 goodness me i remember this very well I was 15 years old um three each draw with with celtic at ibrox incredible afternoon you have to say loudrick mccoy and a tosh mckinley on goal i think tosh mckinley's still wandering around doing that sort of celtic kick to be perfectly frank um but the 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 headlines of that afternoon unquestionably um davy robertson having his goal chopped off and stv jerry mcnee namely um taking an age to understand that it actually had been called off but even now it probably not being that clear as to why because he certainly wasn't offside um but the last time i think you had on um jb we spoke about a, a huge double save that andy gora made from henrik larson um, in an old firm game at ibrox same on this afternoon andy gora makes an incredible save um against pierre van hoydonk and when you're looking at obituaries recently of course when when um, the goalie sadly left us um that save that he makes from van hoydonk just just comes up and you remember it quite vividly don't you yeah i mean i was probably quite lucky that night my season ticket that was my first season ticket so i was only 10. Wow. still catching it up but the uh <laughs> The, I was in the West Enclosure, so I had a great view on it. Um, so I can, I can remember the cross coming in, which Tosh McKinley from the left. Yep. And it was you kind of just go, oh no, you just <laughs> your heart skips a beat, and you're almost like, this is it. And then I can just remember this arm coming out of nowhere, just rising up and bang. And uh, I've been fortunate enough to meet Andy Gordon a couple of times through various sports and dinners and stuff. Um, we actually met him in the Derry Club in Liverpool and he was doing a night in there and I remember saying to him, what about that save? <laughs> it was if, uh, if I had a drink for every time somebody told me it, it spoke about that, I'd be an alcoholic. Uh, <laughs> was, he was, he, as I say, you could talk all day. There's, there's, I was thinking about this earlier for enough because I knew that we were going to obviously come on to talk about this. And as much as you remember goals and wins and trophy title lifts, Sometimes there's there's a handful of things you remember, like a good tackle. I can always remember a Bouguera tackle late on in an old yeah. firm. Uh, McGregor's save away at Bremen. I remember being in the stands that night and, and kind of looking and going, that's us done, and then out of nowhere. Um, and that definitely falls under that category. But obviously, Kevin Thompson always gets the, the double old firm tackle. Uh, he, did, he did more than that, to be fair, but he always gets <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's just one of them things that just it, it just it's ingrained in Rangers history now, isn't it? In terms yeah. of magical moment for the for the club and the play, and it's what makes what made them um, the goalie. Do you know it was very the, the that moment actually when Van Hoydonk sort of he's in mid air, catches it perfectly, as you say, got him almost out of nowhere, um, sort of claws it away. It was very similar to the goal that um, Nkunku scored for for Leipzig against McGregor. Um, and and the, the sorry the three one game of course um, at Ibrox so it was very very similar to that but it was something that I remember very well the the confusion over the David Robertson um, situation was was really bizarre I, I watched some footage of it again today and you know, the, the offside call is is bizarre to say the least um, maybe not surprising but certainly bizarre JB I think if that one it probably just goes to show how the difference between mentality. Um, I can picture the disallowed George Cadet goal. Uh, yeah. People, because <laughs> it pops up every other week on social media. Yeah, um, David Robinson one. That's even more. I'm not going to say blatant because I don't. I just think it was a genuine mistake. Do you know what I mean? But the uh, I don't mean that sarcastically either. Um, it, was, it, it must have been about three or four yards on. Do you know? Like it wasn't even up to the base. And I think for the fact that um, if we. Think of the fact if we had the similar mentality to maybe other clubs, it would, that would be one that maybe would do, be doing the rounds on a on a weekly basis. Do you know what I mean? But um, but now, yeah. For, funny enough, every time I think of David Robinson, I always think of that goal, but I never thought of being disallowed because yeah. you pitch, again that was on my, my side on the left hand side, and I, I played fullback, albeit not very well when I was younger. So um, whenever a fullback used to hit the back of the net, it used to be made up. But uh, I always remember Alex Clellan's. 
Uh, <laughs> all, um, always sticks in my mind as well. But yeah, no, it was a, um, obviously didn't go on to get the win on the day, but it was a, uh, certainly an eventful one. Yeah, listen, two years later, um, we drew one each with Celtic Park, with Celtic at Celtic Park. We were going for 10 in a row. Of, of course, at, at that point, it was the end um, of, of careers for, for many at Rangers. Um, and that after, afternoon and night, I think it was a nighttime match, actually. Um, Negri scored, I think it was his only goal against Celtic. Wonderful effort, 27th of a really prosperous season for Marco Negri. Of course, we did have Paul Gascoigne sent off, involved in a wee bit of a tangle with, I think it was Morton V. Cost, Settler, one of their big centre mids. Um, looked soft, I personally felt, back then, still do now. Um, but the maybe the thing that, that sort of comes back, because that was such a huge re- year, Rangers missed out on, on 10 in a row by two points um, that year. If they win that game, who knows who we're talking about as far as history and all that's concerned. But um, can you remember that game, GB? Were you at Celtic Park, weren't they? Definitely wasn't at the game, no. I think my dad was, because if I remember right, it was at a reduced capacity. I've got a feeling they might have been next one. I'm sure my dad was there. Um, was down in, that's why I remember it was a midweek, otherwise I'd have definitely been watching it with them. But the, um, we could, I watched it funny enough, whenever we do these type of things, we always type it into YouTube to watch the highlights back. We just, <laughs> and uh, we should have been out of sight. I mean, yeah. um, Negri for all this quality and stuff. Um, three or four really good chances before he scored. And he was yeah. so clear that he wasn't that type of player who needed three or four chances. Uh, not that old player. <laughs> He's um, he was he was extremely clinical. Um, you just wonder if we'd have gone on to win that night. The word momentum is so powerful in football, isn't it? Uh, and again, you used if if we'd have won, um, it, you dare say if the roof goal wasn't disallowed. Uh, start of this season, where would that momentum have gone? Albeit, yeah. I think definitely more wrong. Let's not kid ourselves, but um, you just never know because if one club goes one way, what tends to happen in Scotland is one goes the other. Yeah. So, um, yeah, what, what 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 might have been, but yeah. Uh, yeah. So listen, that's your two um, on this days, two big on this days. I have to say, and, and on this days are, are quite um, quite memorable for. For Jamie and I, listen, it's it's an international break, so we don't have a huge amount of of Rangers content to discuss. We should be able to keep you for the next thirty minutes or so. Um, Jamie, we've got loads of guys out just now on um, international duty. Hadji's out, Ridvan's out, Jack's out, Alex Rowley, Lowry rather, Bailey Rice, Liam King, Sifrentes is away. Ross McCausland is away. Two guys I do want to focus on for the next week. Well, I should say congratulations to Cole McKinnon and Robbie Fraser, who have been called up to the, the under-21s. I think it was early or on this morning or potentially at some point yesterday. So um, they've absolutely been involved into the, uh, are drafted into um, the under-21 set, which I think is a huge deal. So congratulations to them both. I do want to speak a little bit about Yanis Hadji, JB. Um, obviously out in loan, Beal fired him out on loan. Um, I think in the position that he would probably probably play at Rangers, we see guys sort of squeezing in and then trying to look fit and we're trying to manipulate them into a, a, a fashion. Lammers is obviously the sort of one that jumps in straight away. Um, and I think it applies to Hadji and Lowry if they were still around and in the fold amongst the first team squad. Do you think they play ahead of Sam Lammers? It's a tricky one, Lammers, isn't it? Because we, 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 we all want him to do well. Let's have it right. You know what I mean? But it looks as if he's in the wrong movie, doesn't he? <laughs> uh, that being said, um, the man, the, the man has given him a chance. Um, we've been winning, um, and he hasn't been playing particularly well. Obviously, had that wonderful strike. He's obviously in there for a reason. Maybe he sees him as more of a physical option uh, when we're defending their pieces or something. Um, because it's certainly not for his creativity. Um, yeah. I mean, he does create. Uh, he has created a few chances that we maybe haven't put away uh, on the on, on the back of things. But yeah, he just looks really uncomfortable. Um, in, in regards to Hadji, again, uh, he, he could potentially, and I've seen I've seen mixed response to this on social media. Um, he does be has become a better player since he left. Yeah. Um, um, he he was he had a shocking start to the season um, prior to him getting the injury uh, before he got the injury a couple of years back. Come back and just never really looked right, did he? Um, and 
last season in fits and starts. You could see, oh God, there he is. And he was he almost looked as if he was trying too hard, but he almost looked as if he'd lost a yard of pace that he couldn't afford to really lose. Um, he's never been the quickest, but he definitely, it's a, it's a real tricky one because is he any better than Alex Lowry? Um, would probably be my question. So if, he, if there was an option to sell him and potentially get some money, I mean, there's certain, certainly some, teams in Turkey that would probably look to, would, would certainly be eyeballing them, maybe even just for the fact of the name. Um, he's obviously doing relatively well with the, the national team. Uh, I think if we were back to replace Lammers, then yeah, there's probably an argument in that because I think he would offer more. or it, In chances he creates goals, assists, I think he'd do okay. Uh, but I, I think he probably would 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 I swap him for McCausland? I appreciate we've only seen a wee bit of McCausland. I'd probably say no. Um, swap him for Tom Cantwell, most definitely. Would I swap him for Tom Lawrence? Most definitely not. Most definitely not for obviously uh, Cantwell as well. So yeah, I just don't know. I just can't see where he fits in. If he was to come back in January um, and under the new manager, could maybe find look to get the best out of him. Um, obviously. Did Clement have him again? Kind of, uh, uh, about right? I think he did for a period. I'm not entirely sure if it was for a long period of time because obviously Clement sort of disappeared. Um, but I think he was around for a, for a, a small period of time for sure. I know that obviously he was signed by the director of football. I think we're going to talk about a wee bit later on. But he's one of them, Hadji, if you put his highlights together, uh, you've got one hell of a player. Um, he's, he's delivered on some really big moments for the club. No, no, dip, no more than obviously the Braga game, which I think was a handful of appearances into to his, his time at Rangers. Uh, his goal last night, funny enough, was very Braga esque. Um, yeah, it was it absolutely was. That was good to see. But um, I mean, I seem to feel as if I say this after it on every every pod. But uh, his fifty five season was outstanding. But yeah. again, that fall under the category of it was a very unusual time to play your football. Uh, without the pressure on the crowds, was he trying things he maybe wouldn't try? I mean, I think we might have had. I mean, sure, sure, somebody in the comments will com- uh, will will know, but I think we had like three or four one nil Hadji wins in that season. Um, was was good, yeah, absolutely. Um, St Johnston at home are two that kind of stick out in my head. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm a massive fan of him because uh, I think he he kind of ticks the box. He gets it. He gets the club. How many times do we say that about players who just don't get the club? I think he gets it, and he's obviously got that big, big mentality. Obviously, potentially on the back of his father as well. So, yeah, he's um, he's not one I'd be too disappointed if we pushed on, but he'd be one I'd be intrigued to see what the manager could get out of him if he was to come back. Uh, he definitely falls under the category though of the the Michael Beale not liking the players that were here first time round. Uh, <laughs> another one of my lines is he. Uh, he doesn't see the players that were here seem to all be punted, whether it be Kamara, Morales, Kent, um, the, the three or four others who just didn't get a look in with them on that on the second time round. Um, but yeah, watch the space for them, but wish him well. Yeah, no, absolutely. It was really interesting. I think Ewan Minton, who joined us on, on YouTube, hi, Ewan, good evening. Um, he referred to a, a podcast that that Hadji had spoke, I think it was a La Liga podcast, official La Liga podcast, and he had said that. Um, he's really enjoying things across in, in Alaves. He's enjoying the weather. He's enjoying the league generally because it's a league that he's he's followed for for a, a huge part of his, his sort of footballing career. Um, and listen, you're absolutely right. I do think that we're at a stage when 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 players do disappear from from Rangers on a, a loan or whatever, and um, they they do suddenly become. Um, almost superstars, but you do wonder if they are better than what we have. RFC 72 refers to to Cantwell and, and Lawrence as direct competition. I, I don't think he does get in ahead of these guys, and I think based on who he is from an image perspective and probably cashing in his surname a little bit and the demand for a Hadji to play in Europe, namely one of the Turkish divisions, um, I think there is an opportunity for Rangers to potentially cash in on him. Um, I think it's easy to maybe consider that the loan has been a mistake based on Sam Lammers' current form. To be perfectly honest with you, I do wonder if Tom Lawrence was was fully fit or we'd seen Cantwell through the centre as a 10. Um, I don't think there would be a huge clamour to really consider um, Yanis Hadji, regardless of him scoring against Israel in an international break, to be perfectly frank. However, 
um, we do understand there's an option to recall him in January, so it'll be one we'll watch. And if um, if Clement was bang on and he said everyone starts on a, a fresh white sheet, um, then who's to say that his um, sheet can't begin at some point in January? Same goes for Alex Lowry as well. So um, it'll be really interesting to see what happens to either. Um, Alex Lowry, of course, um, youth, um, we, we, we love it when young guys, JB, come up through the, the setup. I think it's fair to say six weeks ago that no one would really have expected Ross McCausland to have had the the direct effect he's had on the starting lineup. Now, I don't think anyone probably believes he would be around if, if we had sort of a fully fit structure and a fully fit squad. He's came in, he's took his chance. Now we're talking about a guy who is a fully fledged international. Of course, he made his international debut at sort of full level um, against Glenn Kamara's Finland. Glenn Kamara was excellent on the night. Again, you'll remember that Glenn Kamara. Um, and it's really good to see McCausland just taking his opportunity and flourishing. I think one thing we do have, and we, we speak about it in our sort of WhatsApp chat regularly, is that we're really, really guilty of not giving youngsters a chance. I mean, there's an example, Cole McKinnon, Robbie Fraser, called up to the Scotland R21s. I would say there's a good chance you won't see them in the first team this season either. Um, yet they, they're, they're getting called up to play at, at national level. Um, Ross McCausland kind of um, breaks the breaks the mould a little bit by illustrating that. Do you know what I mean? If you take your chances, there's a pathway there. There is an opportunity. Yeah, no, most definitely. I think um, I think we that was the kind of the hope for Alex Lowry, wasn't it? Um, every time you see Alex Lowry, every time you put him on a football pitch, he does something. He, he either finds a pass, a clever shot, uh, shoulder. There's just always something. Uh, but obviously, we, I know this. It's been documented. Obviously, is um, is tragic off the field circumstances. Yeah. You just going away to hearts, getting plenty of minutes, playing at a probably training at a lower standard, if if, if truth be told. But a, a really good club for him to go to. Um, I think uh, it's one of the things that's really frustrated me over the years is when we've sent players out on loan. As soon as you're sending a player out to a non SPL team. Um, there's a good chance they're not going to make it at the age of 19, 20, 21. Uh, you could probably name on one hand. I think Charlie Adam probably is a bit of a standout of somebody who maybe went to visions to then come back up and, and have a rel- and I'll have a good career, to be fair to him. But uh, just jumping back to McCausland, he's, um, he, I think he's just brought a bit of freshness. He's yeah. kind of just... Um, of, it's good when players can come in when the team's playing well. Uh, he's obviously come in under Clement and Clement's seen the fact that he's bringing in a level of energy. Um, one of the things I think that's been lacking in, in the Rangers team for the last few years uh, is energy. Uh, we've had plenty, and you've probably put Hadji into that category as well. We've had plenty of players with technical ability, uh, but players who just go past someone with pace. Uh, what I love about him and me and my dad talk about this all the time, I love how brave he is on the ball. Um, I was up for the Livingston game, um, last game, and whether you see it on the TV as much, but one thing he's very good at, he uses Tavernier as a shield, so almost Tav makes the run, but he's more than happy to go inside. I've seen Sifuentes given his opportunity on that right-hand side, and he just wants to pass the ball, and as, yeah. as we said, just do wee jogs around the pitch. Um, but it's almost the case of this kid's not going to do the easy thing. Now, whether he would maybe do the easy thing if we weren't playing well, uh, or the team are maybe 1-0 down or whatever it might be, you just see he's full of energy, he's full of life, he's got just a bit of a spark. Um, the, way, the, way, the way he turns, um, it certainly it might, be, it might be the type of thing that we maybe need against some of these, I mean, I hate the phrase low block, but these teams that defend, uh, defend a wee bit deeper, Somebody that can maybe drop a shoulder. You haven't got to be lightning quick. Uh, but if we can maybe create something out of nothing, uh, definitely gives us a different option. Uh, but as you said, the fans will be patient with um, with youngsters um, to a point. Um, but <laughs> definitely one that we, um, he just feels as if he, he actually looks like a fan who's who's good at football, as opposed yeah. to maybe maybe throwing him or throw him in because he supports Rangers, he'll get it. Uh, <laughs> a bit more there with him so uh, no long may it continue and um, I'd be really disappointed if he doesn't get a start um, against, I know we'll get to this later against Aberdeen away first game back because the kid's on a high do you know what I mean keep him going I, I yeah no brainer no brainer for me 
Um, we, and we, we need to try and lose this myth of uh, when we come up against these so-called difficult teams in Scotland, that, oh, it's going to be physical, it's going to be a battle. What happens when all these European teams absolutely pummel at every team in Scotland? They don't go, oh, for Salisbury, it's going to be a tricky place. The yeah. stadium will be half empty. If yeah. you can score the goal, the, the, do you know what I mean? We just need to make sure that we're going to these games and playing our football, which I actually think will be a good thing with, with Clement. He will just see this as a game of football. Uh, and as he, I love the way that he described the Livingston game. Uh, if we have to play them on the car park, we will. Uh, that's <laughs> yeah. one that's not going to say, and, right, I mean, I remember Gerard. I mean, I, I think we all love Gerard's press conferences. They were box office, weren't they? Every yeah. single one. They put on a little line. But I remember him building up Hibs in Aberdeen. I think when we played Hibs once, and I don't think they won a game in nine. And all of a sudden, it was almost like, Oh, Hibs are a good side. It's going to be a battle. We're going to need to be ready for war. And you're like, no, you're not. Just pass the ball around them because they're like traffic cones. <laughs> but yeah, no, definitely, um, definitely keep the momentum with the wee man and hopefully he pushes on. Yeah, absolutely. I, I like that you sort of referred to his aggressive approach and how offensive he is. I, I completely agree. I, it's been a long time since we've seen anyone, particularly down that right-hand side, look as dangerous and as aggressive with the ball. And I think that's something we should support. And I fully agree with you. If he's not starting the Petodre, I'd be really disappointed. Listen, what I do want to speak to you about, um, and this wasn't particularly an agenda, but we did mention Alex Lowry earlier on. Scott Hammond, who's listening on Facebook, watching rather, um, on, on Facebook tonight. Hi, Scott. Um, he asks, and this may be a valid question, the Shankland rumours have, or the Shankland discussion, obviously, has, has came up after his goal last week um, for, for the national team. And Scott wonders if Lowry would be used um, as a, a make-weight, if you like, for, for Lord and Shankland. Potentially, Scott, potentially, JB, I think the question that I would ask you in the first instance, Jamie, is if there's an opportunity to bring him in in January based on who else we have in that position? Surely someone would need to disappear first. Yeah, no, I think you're right. Um, would I bring him in just to make the numbers up? Probably just to add to what we've kind of already got? Probably not. Um, yeah. If, Say, for example, Kamar Roof was to move on if we were to terminate his contract or whatever it might be, or if the medical department don't think we're going to get anything out of him in the second half of the year, no-brainer. Um, I think somebody that could come in... Um, do I think he's an old firm winner or a European um, last 16 type of player? No, but I don't think that's what you'd be coming in to do. I think that's where you'd be really looking for your likes of Cantwells, your Danilos. These are the guys that are going to give you that extra little bit of quality. But for someone that might just need to uh, bundle over the line against St Mirren away for a 1-0 win, then Chris Boyd, um, very similar to Ilk. My only concern is if we were going to sign him after him scoring, I think it was 24 league goals last year, um, would, it have been last, would it have been in the summer if the cl if he was on the club's radar? Um, he did himself absolutely no harm in his performance at Ibrox the other week because I know we it's we talked it to death in terms of our group chat and people have had arguments online in terms of whether he's good enough. I think we I think sometimes as Rangers fans, because we, we, we aim for the best all the time, we want every of our 22-man squad to be a starter, an internationalist, an absolute world-beater. But what you do sometimes need is you just need that mix of maybe players come in and say, right, you might only get 20 starts this season, but at the end of the day, if you score goals, you'll be staying in the team. Um, and maybe that he might be that type of guy. He might be like a Billy Dodds or um, a Stephen Thompson. Um, is another one that kind of j j jumps out. But... These guys, they've won, they've won trophies. Do you know what I mean? They, they, at the end of the day, if you look back at their career, they can show you the medals. Uh, whereas potentially some of the players that we maybe got on the books at the moment couldn't do that. Um, yeah. So Shankland coming in, I think, is it's worth a risk. But what we've also got to remember as well, as much as we're Rangers and we love it, we wear fans, does Lauren Shankland want to play for Rangers? Now, I think it's well documented. He's a Rangers fan. I don't think there's anyone higher than that. But does he want the, the scrutiny? Does he want the, the pressure of, uh, does he want not being able to go out for a meal with his family and stuff and everything else that kind of comes with that? You just don't know um, until kind of uh, there's an offer out there. Um, as I say, we talk about the Rangers tax quite a lot, but I happen to believe if a player doesn't want to play for a club, that tax comes down quite a lot quite quickly. So 
if we want them in January, I think we should. I'd like to see us do it early in January, early in the window. Obviously, we've got the winter break. I don't want a Lauren Shankland on the thirty first on the tail end of the month yeah. because it kind of defeats the object. If you're going to bring someone like that in, bring him in. Might give us a chance to maybe offload one or two. Um, but no, he's definitely one that I think would be definitely be an interesting one. And as I say, touched on last week, uh, kept a real close eye on him at Ibrox the other week, and I, I was thoroughly impressed. And uh, his movement for the goal the other day as well was uh, was impressive away um, in the Scotland game away from home. So watch this space with him as well. Do you know, it'll be really interesting because you can't help but think that um, our friends across the city will be looking in and around him as well. Um, I, I think in the first instance, you just hope that if he's if he's not going to come to Rangers, he's not going to leave Hearts. That's, that's what my gut reaction would be. You would hate to have another... Um, did I see a Scott Allen scenario? Everyone remembers Scott Allen, who I think I, I don't know if he's playing in Ireland now, um, in, in some way, shape, or form. But um, yeah, you don't want to get to the stage where we we maybe um, have a war, if you like, with with them over a guy that is we we know is a is a Rangers fan. James Glasgow jumps into the the chat via YouTube. Be surprised if we pay cash for another player with no return, given the board talking about player trading model again, which I think is true. Um, more likely to go for a younger player, potentially using Clement and Van der Hayden's um, sort of contacts of, of the, the Belgian league, RFC 72 is absolutely right. We do need Scottish players as well, um, which, which is really true. And I think over the fullness of time, that will become not more of a problem, but I think it shines maybe a bigger light on the focus on these young lads in the academy to be good enough and be be involved in the first team, be involved in these Euro squads. And we know they're there just now, but in some cases, they're just dragged along to make up the numbers, get your name on the bench type thing. And that you, it has to be a stage where these guys become ready to play. You're ready to involve them. So, do you know what I mean? Your centre midfield gets injured and you can say to Cole McKinnon, um, Aaron Lyle, it's your turn to jump on, lads. He's, a, he's a ready to go. He's a here for a reason. This is it. It's really important that, that these kids are, are ready to go. Um, Jamie, one of the things that um, James Bisgrove said very, very recently was that during the international break, and certainly probably edging towards the beginning of September, um, that there would be a director of football stroke um, sporting director in place. As that date of, of December gets closer, I just want to run through some of the people who we've seen mentioned, um, I think firstly we, we can sort of rule Alex Inglethorpe, the, the chap who's in and around the Liverpool Academy, looks after the Liverpool Academy. We know that he's he's not going to be it. Um, other names in there that I've seen mentioned this week are Dougie Friedman, um, formerly of Crystal Palace, and um, Paul Mitchell, who's worked with Clement previously. Um, we reckon he is he's the main man um, at Manchester United should that sort of take over, etc. go through. Um, Paul Joe's boy was mentioned previously and Sir David Weir, of course, was, was mentioned in the matches previously as well. The one chap who has came out of nowhere almost as the lead um, is, and I may butcher this, I apologise if I do, Dimitri De Conde, um, who was with Philippe Clement at Genk. Now, I know you've done your research on Jamie before we start, so why don't you tell us a little bit about him? Yeah, so his obviously names popped up. Uh, now, you might argue it's maybe a lazy link, uh, given the fact that um, obviously Clement's worked with him uh, in the past. Now, it's probably worth, probably worth saying li there's limited information out there in terms of directors of football. Uh, we were talking about this earlier. F fans, as much as we obsess over managers and players and watch YouTube videos, it's very difficult to get a lot of information on directors of football because if we're all being perfectly honest, we don't know what they do. Do you know what, what I mean? mean? And it depends on what the remit of the director of football is going to be. Now, are we looking for someone that's going to focus on transfers? Because uh, that's kind of that's kind of a big baby, and that was one that was kind of thrown at Ross Wilson quite a lot. Um, is it going to be focused on youth in terms of how do we get the the youth academy and the players coming through and that keep that cycle of looking to try to make profit off youth academy? Are we looking for them just to be a bit of a leader and coordinate the football departments? Or are we looking for someone that's going to come in and do the full shebang uh, including the playing style. Uh, yeah. So if, if Clement was to come in and do a really good job, then the next Clement's kind of lined up and ready to come in. Um, what I want to do is go from a from a Gerard to a Van Bronck to a Clement to a Beal or Beal to a um, into a Clement and just go this four different playing styles yeah. and every every time 
change your manager. There's just no continuity. So it's going to be an interesting that that will be an interesting one in terms of how that how it all pans out. But in terms of the Conda, um, again, if that's if that's how we're pronouncing his name, worked with them. Um, really good, really shrewd in the transfer market. Um, so Genk were never really known as a club that were that recycled players. But had some really good play. They've had some really good players come through the box. No more than Sander Berg. I think he's probably one of the poster yeah. boys in terms of the, the deal that they brought him on. Super low, made a massive profit. Uh, our very own Yanis Hadji. So football is a small world. <laughs> Um, could Clement and the Conda come in and uh, revitalise Yanis? Who knows? Uh, and then there's uh, Joachim Mahel. Um, I probably butchered that name as well, but that's the Denmark Denmark left back um, who thinks gone on to have a really good uh, career in Serie A as well. So he's um, he kind of ticks the boxes, but again, it does feel like a wee bit of a lazy link given yeah. the fact that he's worked with Clement in the past. You know what I mean? So. Um, I think Paul Mitchell would have been would have been a really good one. Uh, that might be right guy, wrong time. Um, in, in terms of him, because that again that ticks the boxes in terms of understanding Clement. Um, and Clement was very he might go. He didn't do too good of a job in Monaco. And he went, he was quite quick to punt him. Uh, I think all parties kind of agreed it was the right thing, given the fact that they'd gone through a wee bit of a sticky patch. Yeah. But Clement tackled really well. Uh, the Alex Inglethorpe one, I know, is one that me and you have spoken about offline. Um, that one seems very highly unlikely, uh, given the... I spoke to a couple of people in, in and around Liverpool, um, and they very much said that he's he's heavily involved now in the coaching of his son's football team at Liverpool. Um, <laughs> guy that used to do that, he headed to Saudi with Gerard. Um, what I believe was... Did he, 10 times his salary um, than what he was on at Liverpool. May even be more, uh, believe it or not. Um, but I think he was something... Yeah, I think it might have even been more. I don't even want to go into them stupid numbers. But um, <laughs> And again, the, Dougie Freeman is one that you mentioned there as well. So there's not a lot out there. I think it's probably one that might bring somebody in that nobody's ever heard of. Uh, yeah. Again, it all jumps back to that point of what is the remit of the guy. If it's just someone that's going to kind of tick a box and just be someone who's going to centralise everything, you might look to go maybe someone who has got an affinity for, to the club. Yeah. Um, we all agree the club's evolved past having, it's got to be a manager that's involved in the, in the running club, but someone, and again, just going rogue here, someone like a Craig Moore, yeah. who's heavily involved in, I think he's in the scouting game now, so therefore you'd like to think he'd be involved, he'd, he'd, he'd understand that aspect of it. Um, we maybe they don't need to be too snobbery as well. Uh, I mean, you've only got to look at Ajax, uh, Mark Overmars. I don't think he'd done too much that after the football work uh, before he started sending dodgy pictures around to uh, the female members. Of <laughs> uh, but hadn't done it before, got into Ajax, brilliant. Van der Sar got in there and do it. So yeah. there's a lot. Davey Weir as well, gone in and uh, by all accounts he's doing a fantastic job at Brighton. So we might need to take a punt on someone that hasn't been a director of football before and maybe mould the role based on what the, what the business what the business and the team need right now. Yeah. Um, it's yeah, it's an interesting one. I'm sure it's going to be one that's going to spark a lot of debate. Yeah, and it, it's I think you're absolutely right. One of the things that gets me is that you you almost it's the one position in football. Where you think it's, it's directly linked to the football, of course, it's football centric, and you almost think that that guy wasn't a good player, so he's automatically going to be rotten at being the director of football. When realistically, um, it, as you sort of led with from the out, was no one really understands, I don't want to say understand, that sounds really condescending, but I think there's a there is a lack of knowledge on what the director of football, the sporting director, does Monday to Friday, and it has to be a lot more than what you think it is when you're sitting playing football manager in your bedroom, sort of three or four nights a week. Um, it's a, a Rangers is going to be a huge job because the, the the previous chap that was in there, sort of, while I wouldn't say left under a cloud, there's a lot of focus on what Ross Wilson had done previously. And there's a lot of people that believe that he didn't do um, a great job and he just wasn't good enough to, to be in that position without, again, probably understanding exactly what the role entails and what the expectancy of the role would be over a, a period of time. Um, that's why I think if if Clement brings in someone who, or if Clement is indeed involved in suggesting someone or bringing in someone who he knows, 
I think it's quite a shrewd bit of business by Rangers. If it's this chap, the Conde, then then great. He's, he's got lots of positive sort of bullet points that go against his name, which is great. Um, anyone that's making three hundred million pounds worth, maybe euros actually, but anything that that, that speaks that value. Of, of money coming into the club, I, I think is is somebody well worth considering. And the fact that he knows our new manager, um, I think would would help absolutely immensely. Um, JB, we're obviously coming back after the international break at the weekend, and there are ten games to go between Sunday and the end of the calendar year. I'll run through them very very quickly. Assuming my calendar's right. Um, Aberdeen away on Sunday, next Thursday, sorry, week on Thursday, 30th of November, we've got Aris um, at home, St Myrne at home the weekend after that, Hearts away midweek after that, Dundee at home after that, away to Betis on the Thursday the 14th, um, League Cup final at Hamden on the 17th, Motherwell at Firth Park on the 23rd, big thanks to the SPL for arranging that, um, Ross County I think at home on the 27th, and and we're at Breeze Block Towers on the thirtieth. Um, you, you've you've missed one out as well. Go on then. What one did I miss? Johnston, the rearranged one that's been thrown in for the twentieth of December. Well done, good man. Do you know that way when I when I wrote it down, I thought I'm sure I've missed something there, and I but knew the there was a rearranged game that had to be put in somewhere. I just wasn't sure where it was going to go. Um, Wild, so isn't it? It's just bonkers. Eleven eleven games. Um, before the end of the year and each one each one probably really important for its own individual reason I, th- I you can hear Philippe Clement just saying that he'll take each game um, as it comes um, the big games that obviously jump out I, I personally think I, I think the big one out of the international break is a really big one I think travelling to Pataudry is a, a big game regardless of how rotten you think they will be they hate us up there and they won't have a right go at us and they will probably feel that they can do something against this this Rangers side um obviously the League Cup final um so soon to Christmas it would be nice to give the the supporters something wrapped up for for um Christmas time coming and of course at, at the end of the the year you've got a trip across to um to Celtic Park um loads of games loads of football to get through between now and then the year Jimmy Expensive running, I know that. I, uh, <laughs> very chatting it through in terms of planning, because like, obviously when you live where we live, it's a case of your options are you can jump in the car or or you can get the train. Uh, yeah, we cool. just the trains are so we had a we had a weekend to look forward to St Mirren at home. Uh, trains all booked, and then there's a train strike. So uh, <laughs> overnight hotel stay and stuff. So yeah, it's going to be an expensive month for the fans in December. But one thing's for certain. They're gonna turn out in mass numbers, aren't they? Do you know what I mean? Um, I think if we if Clement can just if we can get them drilled to come through this this gap, uh, this group, this set of fixtures, and if we can get into if we can get into that that, that old firm game with bare minimal dropped, or certainly match them from now to now till that point, yeah. uh, be very satisfied. I, I think. Um, and again, without building games up, Aberdeen away and Hearts away is going to be a bit of an acid test within the 10-day period. Um, not because of their quality, I might add, but more for the fact of can they handle that fan situation? Can we go into a little bit of a hostile environment and, and nip it in the bud um, early? Can we get these teams and just just completely kill the confidence from the get-go? Um, I think the international break has probably come at a, a good time prior to them big fixtures. Uh, so you, if I think of the likes of Sima in the last couple of games, um, as much as he's added value, you could just see he just looks a little. Yeah. Um, he's not a guy that's probably been used to playing two games a week for since the start of the season. Missed yeah. very, hasn't missed a lot of football. Danilo, we probably put quite a lot on him, probably more than what we originally probably wanted to. Um, a lot of the players, Lundstrom and Jack, having to play every single minute of every single game of the last few weeks, it felt like. So maybe it has come at a good time. Uh, the international break, we won't just won't, we probably won't know that until the end of this block. Uh, but I think the priorities are it's got to be wins in every single league game. There's no point. In, we we haven't left ourselves the luxury of going into games where a draw away at Aberdeen or a draw at Tyne Castle is a good result. We've got to go there and win, and it's it's non-negotiable. Um, and then the European games. Hopefully, we no messing about at home to Aris. 
um, and that take that take care takes care of itself. Um, as much as I'd like to win the group, it's not the be all and end all. Uh, or be able to dodge one of the Champions League teams in the qualifying rounds, but um, not the end of the world. And as you touched on there, the big one is the the cup game as well. Um, we we need something. I touched about I said the word momentum earlier. Um, that league cup win could be the momentum that we maybe that that this the manager and this group of players maybe need to kind of maybe showcase how good they actually are. Because we fortunately in the last how many years we haven't given ourselves the opportunity to see whether a league cup win could actually spare spare a team on or spare a club on. Uh, the fans will remain consistent, but I mean, I don't think the fans need the cup win. And what I mean by that is, we'll be there in the numbers, and we'll we'll sing we'll sing as loud as we do every other week. But you just wonder whether the players just having that little bit of confidence, that little taste of success, um, might potentially vitalise them and re- revitalise them um, going into the second half of the season. Yeah, and of course, it's the um, it's probably the that trophy is the one that's missing since we returned to fighting weight, as far as I'm concerned. So. There is a, there's a huge, and regardless of who was in charge, for us getting to the League Cup final, it could have been Michael Beale in charge, Giovanni Van Bronckhorst in charge, the importance of winning that trophy, um, I don't think can be overestimated, to be perfectly frank. It'll be a really interesting afternoon. There's loads of football to get through before then. As I look at it, the, I mean, really the only game you could almost say you could tolerate a defeat and I would I love to say it on a Rangers podcast, certainly, but the only match that you would maybe tolerate at defeat would be the match in Spain. Um, I, I, I think you could almost sort of put up with maybe going over there and I don't want to say not having a great night, but you could handle going there and getting beat, particularly if you come back on the Sunday and win the League Cup final and add that to the trophy cabinet. I think it's tremendously important that um, December in particular is a hugely successful month um, for Philippe Beaumont and Rangers. It really is. That better away games feels like a, a, a llamas in behind Dessas type of game. Um, Absolutely, yeah. And if you if you need the lead Danilo and Lawrence and Cantwell and the likes to come off the bench for the last twenty minutes to try and maybe nick it because we've kept it really tight, um, then that that feels um, that feels like one is to your point that we could potentially take a hit on if things go well. So if we can get a win against Aris and then say for example Prague and Betis draw then a draw for us would be enough over and better. So that type of scenario mightn't be might be too bad. Let's just hope we don't no messing about against Aris. I think that's the headline, isn't it? You just need to get back to bed. And then the players can potentially not necessarily relax, but certainly it, 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 that that game becomes a little bit insignificant in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, absolutely, 100%. Listen, Blue Bells of Blue has gifted um, five This Is Ibrox, your Rangers podcast membership, so thanks for that. And as always, Blue Bells, we appreciate you you falling. We know you're in and around us every time we're on, so we appreciate your support as per usual. Jamie, um, listen, that'll just about wrap us up for tonight. As always, it's always good to have you on, buddy. Thanks for joining us tonight. Yes, thanks very much. Uh, one thing I will call out just for the for the viewers to maybe take a look at, um, Sir Fuentes actually played 90 minutes against Venezuela. There's like a 20 minute highlight package. Um, and don't get me wrong, you won't be overly impressed by a uh, post it of him. Um, he does get this allowed and he actually plays in a number 10 position. So if you want to see a little bit of Sefuentes, because I'm conscious we haven't, um, then if you just go into YouTube and type in uh, Ecuador v Venezuela, you'll, you'll quite quickly find the highlights. But no, uh, it's been good, good, good to be back talking about Rangers. And uh, yeah, not what, not I'm just. Another week to go, and then we'll be back to um, back to the, doing the thing we love. So absolutely, absolutely. Um, so listen, as I say at the start, if you are following us on on social media, I, we thank you for that. Just to remind you, we're on YouTube and Facebook. If you are watching us on our YouTube channel, please like and subscribe to to what we're up to. Uh, by all means, leave leave a comment should you choose to do so. We're across all the social media: Facebook, we're in Twitter, as I say, Threads, TikTok. And um, we're available wherever you get your podcast. Don't forget, we are rolling out lots of audio only stuff just now via Spotify and Apple Podcast. The Reliving Rangers episode with Kieran Wallace is available for you to listen to live now. If you do get the chance to to jump on and listen to that, I recommend you do. A very, very good feature from Ben Harshaw, which we will be hearing a little bit more of as time passes. On Wednesday of this week, we return. It's Ross and Reese and Andy when they look ahead to Rangers coming back next Sunday afternoon and we can't wait join us if you can thanks for watching bye for now